Hi, everyone. We're back uh, for lecture number two, picking up where we left off. Um, in the first lecture, we talked a little bit about uh, why the peace of Europe, you know, this period from 1815 to 1914, <clears throat> is a bit of a fallacy. Um, you know, if we look more globally, which this class challenges us to do, we can recognize how European historians are really only, when they talk about the peace of 1815 to 1914, they can really only call it the peace of Europe. Um, because a lot of European military energies were being spelt, spent elsewhere, colonizing Africa, colonizing Southeast Asia. And then towards the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the peace of Europe is really kind of only a name only. Uh, and that's because not only had the German nation unified as a singular uh, people, therefore upsetting the balance of power that von Metternich set up in 1815, but also there were a number of alliances that meant that if even a small conflict occurred, it could quickly blow up uh, into a continent-wide affair. And that's exactly what happens. We talked a bit about, in the first lecture, how Gendrilo Princip, a Serbian nationalist with ties to a terrorist organization known as the Black Hand, assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Now, this sounds like a, an extraordinarily big deal, and it was. I mean, he's the heir to the throne for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But it's not a moment that should have necessarily plunged uh, all of Europe, and then eventually all of the world, into a global conflict. Uh, it could have been sorted out by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Serbia, and the Balkan states by itself. But because of those really important alliances that have been created, uh, when Austro-Hungary moved on Serbia, it brought the Russians in. When the Russians were brought in against Austro-Hungary, the Germans were brought in against the Russians, which meant the French were brought in against the Germans. Now, the Germans had a very, this is where I left off in the first lecture, and I want to get back to it. The Germans had a very um, clear plan, a uh, very clear objective for how to win uh, a war in Europe, especially with the alliances. It was called the Schlieffen Plan. Uh, it was established in the 19th century, and the plan was simple. Rather than invade, if you look at our screen here, rather than invade uh, to the south and to the west, right? Moving from Germany here south towards Paris, capture the capital, right? Rather than move this way, because this region of southeastern uh, France was heavily fortified. The French and the Germans had fought over this region for a very long time. So rather than attack the heavily fortified, right, there were a lot of um, outposts and, and different uh, obstacles for conquering. Rather than move south uh, and west, the Germans were actually going to move north and then south uh, to get to Paris. But this meant that Germany had to invade Belgium, a neutral country, in order to get to Paris. And ultimately, even though the English had signed a deal with the French to support them, if a war ever broke out, uh, when Germany declares war on France, the English don't join right away. It's only after Germany invades neutral Belgium, especially when they move through the capital of Brussels. There's all these reports about uh, the German Huns moving through Brussels, burning the libraries, uh, pillaging the town, sexually abusing women, children. When this news gets to England, uh, the British have no choice uh, but to declare war on Germany, too. And then the First World War has begun in 1914. And even though all sides, the United Kingdom, France, Russia on one side versus Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire on another, all sides thought that the war would be over in a matter of weeks, right? They all had these great plans. But what actually happens is the war stalls. The Schleifen plan is in unsuccessful. They're not able, the Germans, to capture Paris quickly which means a second front against the Russians is going to open. So there's two fronts. The western front here, which runs mostly through um, parts of eastern France, and then the eastern front over here in the east, which runs mostly through parts of western Russia. Two fronts develop, and the war that everyone thought would be over in a matter of weeks drags on for months, and then years. And this war is totally different from any other war that had fought previously. And it brings us to our second lecture question. Why? Why was the war that began in 1914, World War I, why did it look so different from previous wars? And here's really kind of a map of those two different fronts, right? You've got the Western Front here uh, and the Eastern Front over here. There are some battles that are fought down here in the Ottoman Empire. Most importantly, this one right here, the Battle of Gallipoli, which is actually uh, organized by Winston Churchill, and it's a total naval disaster. Uh, and if you're a military historian, really worth, worth looking into, um, because the uh, landing at Gallipoli is, is an absolute disaster. Um, thousands of Australian, Canadian, and Irish soldiers uh, go to die there against the Ottoman Empire. 
And it really cre creates a lot of distrust for Winston Churchill. Um, but that's neither here nor there. We're going to focus on uh, the Western and the Eastern fronts and the ways that these fronts really demonstrate how different uh, the war looked from previous wars. Here's kind of a closer map. The wild thing about World War I is that there are skirmishes elsewhere, right? There's fighting that takes place in North Africa. Um, there's a little bit of fighting, like I said, in the Ottoman Empire, in the Mediterranean. There's a whole Atlantic theater, right? There's battles in the Atlantic between warships from Germany and Great Britain in particular. Um, but nowhere near the global conflict that World War II is, although we'll make the point that they're ultimately connected. Now, there's no real battle in the Pacific like there is in World War II. In fact, most of the fighting and most of the casualties are going to occur in very small pieces of Western France, and I'm um, sorry, of Eastern France and of Western Russia, along the Eastern uh, and Western fronts. And you can see a map of them here. And this map's really useless to you unless you study military history, which uh, I don't, but this is far more interesting. What was the defining aspect of the First World War? Uh, historians unanimously agree. Uh, if you're looking from a military technological um, perspective, trench warfare. Uh, the top left image is an aerial photo uh, of um, eastern France that you can still see today if you're to visit. And I, I definitely recommend a lot of people go to Normandy, which, of course, the beaches of Normandy during the Second World War, very worth visiting. Um, but it's equally important to really recognize uh, the theater of the First World War. Um, Americans, in particular, know the Second World War very well, but know very little about uh, the First World War. And that makes sense. The U.S. was in the First World War for a very small period of time. But for the other powers involved, the First World War is known as the War to End All Wars, uh, which of course doesn't. It actually directly leads to um, the Second World War. But the defining aspect of the First World War were these trenches that are still visible today, although they're becoming less and less visible. Um, so if you're ever in um, eastern France, I definitely recommend taking a look at kind of uh, this area uh, known uh, as the First World War's battlefield and take a look at the trenches. This is what a trench would have looked like. You have a perfectly preserved one down here to the bottom right. And then, of course, an image uh, from the First World War itself. The majority of the First World War was fought in these trenches. And the trench was an absolutely horrific place to be. Not only was it muddy and liable to fill with water, full of rats and disease, uh, it was also surrounded by really deadly areas. What made the First World War so traumatic was that it was a modern war. Right? And we're going to talk a little bit about the modern mechanisms of war that made it a modern war. But it was still fought with 19th century tactics. That is, in the 19th century, there was a prevailing argument that dominated all sorts of war studies. The more troops you have, the better chance you have at winning. And the best way to utilize troops was to um, mount what was often called a charge, right? to charge the enemy with overwhelming force. And once you charge the enemy with overwhelming force, you can capture their position, regroup, and then charge the enemy again. And so you progress forward and forward until you force a surrender. The problem was that this 19th century tactic didn't take into account the modern mechanisms of war that defined the trenches. So what leaders on both sides, whether they be French and English and Russian, or German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman, what they believed the idea was to have your men come out of the trenches, normally when a whistle was blowed, uh, storm the area called no man's land, the area between the two trenches, right? French on one side, for example, French and English on one side, Germans on the other, and in between that area was called no man's land. You can see no man's land depicted right here. Run your men through no man's land and try to have them capture the other trench. The problem was that uh, there are modern war techniques that made this charge incredibly ineffective. Right? There's the machine gun. There's the airplane. There are tanks. There's no man's land, which is rattled with barbed wire, explosive mines. And perhaps even more devastating, there's mustard gas, chemical warfare that can blind uh, entire troops when dropped from an airplane or from a blimp or lobbed via artillery uh, in a matter of seconds. And so the charge was ultimately incredibly ineffective because men running across no man's land were mowed down by machine gun. They stepped on mines. They got tangled in barbed wire. It's an incredibly horrific war. And the chemical warfare is also another one of these aspects that just makes it so horrific. If you're a man in those trenches, you know, you're waiting to hear the whistle where you know you're going to storm across this no man's land. Who knows if you come back or not. You're definitely not going to capture the other trench because you haven't moved yards in months. And that's the thing that defines the First World War. It is a war for yards, not miles, not kilometers, 
right? Not whole nations. It's a battle for yards. And men are dying in the tens of thousands over these small periods of yards in between um, the trenches. And then if you sat in the trench like I was getting to, uh, you were susceptible to attack from the air by chemical gases that could blind you, chlorine and mustard gas, that could blind you or worse, kill you uh, in a matter of seconds. And a lot of men initially weren't equipped with gas masks, which becomes standard issue uh, as both the Germans and the Allies are going to use um, mustard gas, chlorine gas uh, on enemies uh, on the other side. And so what's the result? This is the result of the World War I soldier. A, a, a disease commonly known as shell shock at the time. Shell because the, the bombs that were constantly bursting around um, your uh, trench. If you slept in the trench, you know you often slept underneath the ground. A shell that hit directly overhead could cause a cave-in. Uh, and you, you would die of suffocation uh, just in your sleep or, I guess, violently awoken. And so soldiers often suffered from shell shock. Uh, and this is kind of the social aspect of the First World War. You know, they didn't have a term for PTSD, right? But shell shock was very much um, that condition. First World War soldiers suffered uh, tremendously under the, the modern warfare still being fought by ancient or at least 19th century techniques. So it's a deadly combination, right? New technologies, but old techniques resulted in, in tens of thousands and millions of deaths. And here you have the casualty numbers, which are staggering. Again, the Americans focus so much on the Second World War, but without the First World War, there is no Second World War. And to overlook the First World War, the war that was supposed to be the war to end all wars, is really kind of a an absolute travesty, especially when you consider, you know, look at these numbers. Uh, more than 9 million uh, Russians uh, are going to die. Uh, about 7 million uh, Germans and Austro-Hungarians. Uh, you have almost more than 6 million uh, French, uh, and then it goes down from there. The British are going to lose uh, just over 3 million. Um, the Italians are going to lose about 2.5 million. Uh, and you can see the U.S. Um, the numbers don't even reach the million mark. Perhaps why uh, the U.S. doesn't uh, study the First World War as closely as other questions. And so this brings us to our next question, which I will tackle in uh, the next lecture, but just to recap kind of my first two lectures uh, up to this point, um, the thing I really want us to get away from the first two lectures, and I've got time, is that, you know, first and foremost from the first lecture, that piece of Europe, that 1815, is really just that. 1815 to 1914 was a piece, but only for Europe. Um, the plan, the balance of power created by, by von Metternich is successful in Europe, but if you look more globally, that piece doesn't really exist. Colonization of Africa, brutal, horrific, exploitative. Colonization of Southeast Asia, brutal, horrific, exploitative. And in Europe itself, just underneath that very superficial piece, especially towards the later 19th, early 20th century, there was always this move towards war. A tiny spark sets off a massive global conflict. And then the second lecture, really focusing on why was this war so different? Well, it really has to be when you look at the trenches. Right? This trench warfare, this style of fighting, was horrific because you combined modern mechanisms of war, modern mechanisms of death, with very old 19th century tactics that worked when you had riflemen on cavalry, but didn't work when you were facing machine guns, and you had tanks, and airplanes, and chlorine gas. Um, those things don't really add up. Ultimately, the people who paid the price were the soldiers in the trenches. Uh, without a doubt, um, one of the places I'm glad I'll never have to be was a First World War trench. Um, because it seems like one of the more horrific places uh, in history. We'll look uh, a little bit about the interwar period. So this is the period between 1918, the end of the First World War, uh, and 1938, the start of the Second World War, in the next lecture. And we'll talk a little bit about the ways in which World War II was really just a continuation uh, of World War I.